Well, welcome back. Sorry I haven't been with you lately. I have been traveling, um, and I say this confidently and publicly, knowing that I have people looking after my home. Um, so I'm usually that person who like hides all of their travel adventures until after they've gotten home. But um, I am here with you, and I apologize that I have not been on recently. Uh, feel free to join in the chat or here and uh, let me know live or after the fact what you think about all of this and you know what you think about this topic and just kind of what you you know if you if you've got this or you know somebody who has this what what are your experiences what do you um feel about this and and do you like this term this term that's been coined self love deficit disorder so feel free to weigh in and let me know what you think and you know this is a place for you to voice your opinions safely and you know, come come and discuss as well as listen and hopefully maybe learn something or listen to a different perspective. So uh, thank you for joining me from Salem, Oregon. And I'm, I'm usually coming to you from Chicago, Illinois. And so um, I, I hope that the connection's all right. I've gotten my high-speed internet and I should be ready to go. If you have any problems, again, as always, let me know. So, uh, and FYI, I'm going to have a very soon to come, probably tomorrow sometime, I'm going to have a little um, video log journal about our travels on the Amtrak train Empire Builder from Chicago to uh, Portland, Oregon. And so we'll talk about that a little bit and change up the topic a little bit from just psychology to lifestyle, although there is some psychology involved. Uh, interestingly enough, I met some people on board that train who um, are dealing with with a cluster B individual. So uh, I guess it kind of does overlap with psychology, but if, you, if those of you who are tuning in who know about my adventures are going, huh, you know, why is she doing a podcast about psychology today? Well, I am, but it's only because I want to gather my thoughts for tomorrow to do the vlog and just kind of, you know, settle down a little bit from the trip and and unwind before I revisit all of that. So, uh, you know, the reason I'm doing this specific topic today, self-love deficit disorder, is because it's come up in a few uh, friendships and and in a few relationships with people that I know and people that I uh, care about. And, you know, it's a very pervasive sort of disorder of its own. And it's an interesting phenomenon. So let's talk about what it is first and foremost. Um, so there was this term, I, bl- I want to say it was coined in maybe the 70s, maybe around the time of the emotional sensitivity training phenomenon, possibly, to correct me if I'm wrong, um, and it, it is, you know, codependency. But to me, at least, until I went to school for psychology, that that conjured images in my mind of, like, people who were, you know, addicted to something, who needed something, who, you know, they needed the person they were with and that person needed them, but they both needed something else outside of their relationship. And that's sort of what it is, but not really. And I just don't think the terminology quite tracks with what uh, the disorder actually is. And so I really like this term, self-love deficit disorder. I don't like that people have it, certainly, but I like the terminology. And it's coined by uh, Ross Rosenberg, who in fact is another um, Chicagoan who works in the field of psychology. I know a couple of other people in my area who do, and I just think we've got some cool minds in Chicago. In, with, without even inclu- without even including myself, that was not a humble brag. Like, I know some darn cool people in that area who are in psychology, and it's very interesting to me how psychology and paganism overlap, how psychology and secular humanism overlap, how psychology and politics overlap, um, and you know many of the people that I work with in that area. Um, 
are kind of at the forefront of these various like emerging fields within psychology like um, Jungian analysm and um, you know I have a couple of people I would say myself included on this one who are who are students of um, the archetype school of thought um, and you know that's of course born of Jungian philosophy and Jungian psychology and so we we have some cool minds over there in Chicago and Ross Rosenberg is certainly one of them I believe he's a CPS of some sort so I'm not not sure if he's PsyD or PhD but I know he's like CPS or LCPC or something like that and he's just freaking amazing at what he does I do not know him or work with him personally I make no claim that I do um, I am just a fan. I've watched his YouTube videos. I've seen him on, um, oh my gosh, I'm forgetting the name of the channel now, but there's this wonderful woman who does shows uh, on YouTube about self-love and healing. And I, if I think of her name, I will try to put it in my YouTube uh, video and, and uh, maybe in this in this link here on my podcast somewhere um, that she does shows about like healing and self-love and healing from narcissistic abuse and healing from sociopathic abuse. I know her first name is Meredith. I'm just forgetting the name of her channel, but she's absolutely wonderful. I know that Ross Rosenberg has spoken with her quite a bit and that she's sort of adopted this um, coined term of self-love deficit disorder for folks who are abused by narcissists and sociopaths and that is of course you know what it is if you haven't figured it out already being that self-love deficit disorder is the actual term that thanks to Russ Rosenberg we now use for um for codependency essentially um she she is a really great proponent of you know healing from that and so is he and I think all of us who have experienced narcissistic and sociopathic abuse, either ourselves or with our clients, are, try to be good advocates for folks who have it to heal and to, to move through, um, to move through it. So I'm trying to think of a good way to give you an example of what self-love deficit disorder is, what it looks like, maybe what it feels like. Uh, I always think, and maybe this is why I do what I do for a living, but I always think it's interesting to be able to step into somebody else's shoes and, you know, kind of feel what they feel, understand their perspective, understand where they're coming from, um, understand what motivates them, what makes them tick. And I think that it's an important thing to be able to do in life in general, but specifically when you're dealing with people who have self-love deficit disorder. You've got to be able to understand where the abuse victim is coming from. I want to go off on a really quick sidetrack here, and please stay with me because I think that this is applicable and important. Um, and that is... <laughs> okay, so I've heard a lot lately about, you know, um, celebrities and, and sports stars and politicians and the like who have abused their spouses, their partners, their families, and, and always, always the refrain. We've talked about this before, so you probably knew I was going to go there with the victim blaming thing. Always the refrain is never, it's never like, why did this total and complete and utter asshole abuse his wife or abuse her husband or her child, her child or his child or whatever. It's always, always, always. Well, why didn't the victim leave? <laughs> to me, that you're asking the wrong question. People, come on. How are you going to put that on the victim? How are you going to say, I mean, do, did you look at the Titanic disaster and say, Ugh, why did those people take that ship? No, you didn't. Did you look at, you know, 9-11 and say, well, why did those people take those jobs in those towers? That's just ridiculous. No, you didn't. You wouldn't do that. You, if If you have empathy in other situations, what I'm saying is try to show some toward folks who are victimized by narcissists, sociopaths, and other abusers, please. It's not the victim's fault. It's not, you know, like we've talked about before, it's not a woman's fault that she gets raped on the street. 
because she was wearing a provocative dress. Women in burkas are raped, you know? So please let's stop with that victim blamey BS. It's it's untoward, it's impolite, it's disrespectful, and it's unbecoming. So can we please dispense with it? Thank you very much. Really. But uh so I think it's it's so important to be able to understand where that victim is coming from. And Yes, I'm using the term victim. You probably noticed by now that I am using that that specific term. I am using it for a reason. I think, although I like the connotations of the word survivor, I think labeling folks survivors of abuse or what have you, well, first of all, it, it puts that abuse in the past. For anybody who's been abused, the abuse doesn't exist in the past. It exists. It's with you every day. It's with you every day, and you've got to find a way to live with it, and you've got to find a way to cope with it. And I don't mean you've got to find a way to live with it or you're going to shuffle off this mortal coil. I mean, no, you have to find a way to live with it. You you have to do it. You have no other choice. Um, it's going to eat you up one way or another if you don't. And whether that's through therapy, you know, even just existing day to day is is a victory. It's a win, right? So you're finding ways to deal with it, whether you like it or not, even just by existing. And there are healthy ways to manage um, that stress and that sort of CTPSD, like therapy and and that sort of thing, and, and exercise and having good friends to talk with and just having good social outlets and, you know, having good boundaries with folks and making sure that you have some good close relationships and some good good people in your life that have your back and vice versa. So, you know, those are the skills that we develop. And yes, we're survivors, but we're also victims. And you know what? There's nothing wrong with that word. Really, there's not. there's nothing wrong with that word. We are all victims of something in life. And yes, we're all survivors, but... There's nothing shameful about that word, and I, and so I refuse to let other people dictate what that word means to me and whether or not I use it. So I am going to use that word. It is not something that has a negative connotation or that denotes weakness or, you know, being somebody who was singled out among the herd because you're weak or what have you. It's It's not... A negative word. So just FYI, if you're listening to this and that word is triggering you, or if you're listening to this as somebody who hasn't survived abuse but is empathetic and wants to understand more about this whole toxic abuse syndrome, um, I just want you to understand that this word does not have negative connotations. And that I think the sooner we accept that, and the sooner that we sort of normalize that that term, victim, the sooner we do that, the sooner we stop blaming them, the sooner we stop asking questions like, well, why did she wear that dress? Well, you know, why didn't she leave him? Well, why didn't he leave her, right? And I think this goes really hand in hand with what we're talking about today, which again is self-love deficit disorder. Well, as far as what it is, I, I'm going to give you an example of somebody I've worked with. And I'm I'm certainly not going to give any clues as to who this person is. I'm not outing anybody. Um, this person is someone that I've worked with in the past, not currently. I have gotten permission to, you know, discuss. So I am going to do that. And basically I'm going to give you this example of this this individual I've worked with. So this person is and has been in an abusive relationship, uh, an abusive home relationship for mm, quite a long time. Quite a long time. I'd say oh, well over a decade, maybe more, um, maybe a little longer. And this is somebody who really, you know, in other ways in life has their stuff together. And this is somebody who is, you know, a good stand-up person. You would never know if you met them on the street that they were being abused at home. 
And there's certainly, again, like dispensing with that whole victim blaming thing. I, this is somebody who you would never look at and think, oh, well, you know, he deserved it. You wouldn't think that. You would, you would actually look at this person and think, wow, I, I wouldn't have known. What, wow, what's going on there? You know, because they do seem like they're very together. They have a really great job. They have a great life. They have, you know, in so many ways, they have like a great family life, a great home life, except for the fact that they are being monitored 24-7 by the narcissist that they live with. And what do I mean by monitored? I mean cameras in every room of the house. I mean, she reviews the cameras at the end of each day. And her excuse? Safety. Watching out for the kids. Well, you know, normal people don't do that. And the folks that I ran into on this trip, interestingly enough, um, we were discussing this subject, and apparently the narcissist that they know... Uh, has done this as well, you know, using cameras to watch every move they make, looking at their phone, what have you. And this is what this gentleman that I worked with quite some time ago um, had went through, right? So, and, and goes through to this day. And to this day, it, as far as I know, um, you know, he, he's still in this situation, now, he, I, I have point blank asked this person, and this is, this is a, a friend, by the way, not like a client or something, but I have point blank asked this person, you know, why have you chosen to stay? Like, what do you, I know you're getting something from this. Again, not to blame him in any way, but I've said, you know, I know you're getting something from this. I'm just very curious as to what it is. What, what are you getting from this? What's working for you here? And again, not, not to blame the victim, that's not where I'm going with this, but if we stay in a relationship, if we stay at a job, what have you, whether it's good, bad, ugly, somewhere in between, we're getting something from it. That's why we're staying. That's why we're there. And I have asked him, like I said, pretty much point blank, hey, you know, what are you getting from this? Like, why haven't you left? You're clearly not happy with this situation. You have your financial house in order. You're well off. It's not like you couldn't just leave if you if you decided to. And his excuse for a while was money, and then it kind of stopped being money because it's a ridiculous excuse for somebody who's well off. Um, you know, this person makes like a six-figure salary. And no, I'm not sorry, dude. Money's not an excuse. And again, like he kind of dispensed with that after a while. After we got to know each other a little bit, yeah, that's not really the reason why. Apparently, the real reason why is because um, he had a bad experience with a woman he was with long, long ago, um, taking his child from him, moving away, defying the judge's orders after they ended their relationship and his baby's mother chose to go in a different direction. Okay, again, I'm like, well, you know, that was your previous situation. That's not your current situation. What, what, what's keeping you here now? Well, so finally we get to the bottom of the issue. The bottom of the issue basically consisted of the fact that his current abuser, his current abuser has threatened to do the same thing. Well, you know, you got to understand a narcissist, uh, um, a covert narcissist in particular. A covert narcissist wants to be able to push your buttons. They want to know what gets to you, and they want to act on it. So I can't tell him this. I'll have to fi hopefully maybe figure this out one day if he hasn't already. Um, but And you can't tell anybody this if you have someone like this in your life with self-love deficit disorder. Don't do it. You'll be the bad guy. No matter how good your intentions are, you are the villain if you do this, in their mind at least. But I wanted to say, you know, hey, dude, she's playing on your fear. She's literally playing on this situation, this one aberrant situation that happened to you before, right? So she's, she's playing on your insecurity. She's playing on your fear. And she's playing on the fact that this situation has happened to you once. 
do you really think that a totally different woman that you're with now is going to do the exact same bizarre aberrant thing that really shouldn't have even been allowed by the courts that happened to you with your previous partner? I mean, that that's like a one in a million chance. Also, clearly the person that he's with now is smart enough to make that threat. So I think they're probably smart enough not to defy a judge's orders and take kids out of state or what have you. But still, he's been convinced that this is the consequence, not just for like cheating or doing something horribly wrong or what have you. No, no, no. This is the consequence if he goes out with one of his work buddies. This is the consequence if he just does something she don't like. This is the consequence if anything displeases her. Anything. At all. She divorces him and takes the kids. And, you know, I could sit there and argue with him and say, well, hey, she's got a pretty darn cushy setup right now. Exactly what would make her leave it? You know, she's got you jumping to the beat of her drum. Why would she leave that situation? She wouldn't. But he wouldn't hear it. And why is that? Well, she's got self-love deficit disorder. So that, in a nutshell is what self-love deficit disorder is. And it's why abuse victims don't leave their abusers. They have been convinced that some horrible thing will befall them and that they're just a bad person in general if they leave their abuser. They have been convinced either through direct threats or indirect threats. Um, And I think my friend kind of received both of those things, you know, direct and indirect threats, but through direct and indirect threats, these people are made to feel that, you know, if they leave, there are going to be consequences, and those consequences are not going to end, ever. And if they do, they're not going to end well. Not going to end well. Well, my, my question again for that person with self-love deficit disorder would be if this is somebody who you're going to spend, you know, the remainder of your days with, the rest of your life, you know, 50, 60 years possibly with, from this point on, why would you want to do that? Would somebody who loves you truly, who wants to formulate a healthy relationship and a healthy bond with you, make threats like that? Would they threaten you? Would they, you know, threaten you with just general unhappiness, with specific threats, with I'll take the kids away? That's a really common one for clients and and several people that I know, in fact, um, have had this threat made to them or to somebody they love. And um you know that that threat is very common i'll take the kids i'll take the kids away i will i will disrupt our family and i will take those kids away well right then and there i think that abuser is saying something about themselves and it's something that's kind of ugly it's something that's kind of ugly They're saying, I will act selfishly rather than in the best interest of our children to punish you. Huh. Interesting statement, right? And to you and I, that seems obvious. That seems so obvious. But to somebody with SLDD, that's not obvious at all. To somebody with SLDD, they feel that some minor thing that they may do in the future or have done and gotten in trouble for in the past is reason enough for somebody to A, abuse them mentally, physically, emotionally, any mix they're in. Um, They feel that that's reason enough for, again, for their partner or their loved one to, like, take the kids and leave, despite the fact that it is not in the kids' best interest for them to do that. They feel... They really feel like anything 
that goes wrong, whether on purpose, by their own planned actions, or by accident, is their fault. And to me, that's almost like a reverse form of narcissism. That's almost like a reverse form of narcissism. You are saying, here, why don't you put the weight of the world on my shoulders? I will bear it. I deserve to bear it. I deserve to be punished. I, you know, clearly deserve horrible punishment for stepping out of line in the most minor of ways. Please, put this on me. And with that line of thought and with... You know, that line of action, who is that person going to attract but a narcissist or a sociopath or another cluster B disordered individual, right? So again, I'm not by any means suggesting that it is the person with SLDD's fault that they're being abused, but I am certainly suggesting that there are things they can do to kind of up their boundaries, maintain their boundaries, uh, improve their behavior improve, you know, their actions when it comes to other people so that they can protect themselves a little bit better. Um, and, and I think it's very tough for somebody to do that when they don't have self-respect. And I think that that is what's lacking, interestingly enough, in both narcissists and sociopaths and in folks with SLDD, self-love deficit disorder. So there are some commonalities there. It's almost like they share the perfect sort of sick bond of the things they feel they lack are the things that they feel the narcissist or the sociopath has, that they can fill that void for them. And then, of course, the narcissist or sociopath simply sees that the SLDD person lacks what they lack and says, oh, that person will make a great target for my abuse. I think I'll, I think I'll stick with them. I think I like this person, you know? And so it's kind of a sick relationship that develops. It's kind of a sick relationship. And that essentially is self-love deficit disorder. When somebody feels that they deserve the blame, the punishment, the constant abuse that comes from the slightest transgression or even perceived transgression, when they feel that everything they do isn't good enough, so they may as well not try. When they feel that they'll never be happy, so they may as well not try. That is when self-love deficit disorder comes into play. Now, many folks with self-love deficit disorder grew up with a parent, or more than one parent, perhaps, that has or had a cluster B you know, personality disorder of some sort. Many folks grew up with at least one parent who has or had a cluster B personality disorder. And so they seek out that same type of abuse with their partners, with their bosses, with their friends, with their coworkers in every aspect of their life. And so these are folks who are going to find a lot of abusers to take advantage of them. And unfortunately, the more abusers they find, unlike empaths who oftentimes learn, and sometimes very, very quickly, we get a crash course in the subject, we learn quickly that there are folks out there who are going to take advantage of us, that there is a name for the disorder, and that we don't have to put up with it, right? We learn quickly that that is the case. And like I said, we get a crash course in it. But when we learn, we learn and we don't go back. And we don't go back. And if we do, we recognize it, we snap out of it. 
We don't go back into that relationship with the same person or with anyone else. Someone with SLDD, however, actively seeks out an abuser. They actively and passively actually seek out abusers. And sadly, they find them. They find them. And the more abusers and the more toxic personality disordered folks that they find, the more they can comfort themselves with this almost like bedtime story that they tell themselves about how the abuse is just totally normal, it's not abuse, and everybody should just stay out of their business. Well, you know, that may be the case, and I think that there is something to be um, learned from, from that statement, stay out of my business. Okay, you know what? It's very true. We shouldn't make it our business to tell somebody, hey, you're with an abuser. That's not our place. What we should do is make it our business to let that person with SLDD know, hey, I'm here for you. Are you okay? Not concerned trolling, but genuinely like, are you okay? I'm here for you if you need anything. I'm here for you if you need to talk. And, you know, I think it's just extremely, extremely important that we not go away. We can't be that person who gives up and goes away, but we also can't be that person who says, damn it, you idiot, you're with an abuser, leave. Because we know that's not going to happen. We know that's not going to happen. Um, so, essentially, somebody who doesn't love themselves who doesn't think they're deserving of love at all, and who has been taught through life circumstances and through sustained abuse, is somebody who has a real disorder themselves. It's not, it's not even a matter of just being abused by a disordered person. I think it's really important that we note that these folks, and I don't mean somebody who has, again, like, run into a narcissist here and there. I mean somebody who habitually seeks out these relationships, somebody who habitually underestimates themselves, devalues themselves, undervalues themselves, and simply cannot seem to get it together and, and respect themselves. I'm talking about that person. We've got to understand that these folks are also disordered individuals. And though they can be toxic to themselves, it's important for those around them to remain supportive. Again, no judgment. And as far as dealing with somebody, again, with SLDD, it is so important that we don't judge. I know it's easy to say, again, you idiot, you're with an abuser, why the hell don't you leave? No. Check that impulse. Because, my friend, they don't think they're with an abuser. And if you come at them like that, guess who they're going to think the abuser is and the bully? I'll give you a hint. It starts with a Y and it ends with a U. (laughs) They're going to think you're the abuser. They're going to think you're the bully. They're going to think you're the nasty one. They're going to think you're the one with an agenda. They're going to think you're the one who's manipulating them. So don't do it. Because what have we learned (laughs) from previous podcasts and from previous YouTube videos, and not just mine, but I'm assuming some of you who have actually listened to other, you know, content makers and other people in this industry, what have we learned, right? When we deal with somebody who's a cluster B individual, either by proxy, like through their abuse victim, or one-on-one, you know, us to them, We don't confront them, right? We don't call them out. We call out their actions very, very carefully, step by step. But we don't actually call them out by saying, hey, you asshole, you just did this. Hey, everybody, look, this asshole just did this. Isn't he an asshole? We don't do that, right? What we do is we say stuff like, huh, it seems like you might be a little bit upset right now gosh, I noticed that so-and-so said this to you earlier, and I noticed that right now you're looking like you're feeling a little bit upset, and I'm really sorry 
that you're feeling this way. And I want you to know that if you need to talk, I'm here. And I'm not going to go anywhere. And that's what is, I think, the most important and sort of crucial uh, component to dealing with folks who have SLDD. And it's so important to let them know not only that you're here in this moment right now, but that you're not going anywhere. You're going to be there for them in the future. You're always going to be here. You're going to be that one friend, that one family member, that one coworker, that one loved one, what have you, who consistently loves them unconditionally and isn't going to go anywhere. You're, you're sticking around, right? You're sticking around. You're not going to go anywhere. You're always going to be there for them. Because essentially, what is self-love deficit disorder except the inability to be able to accept love directed toward you, right? They can't accept love. And boy, if you can't accept, you know, conditional love, how the hell are you going to accept unconditional love? How the hell are you going to accept unconditional love? You can't. So the only way to be there for somebody like this is to be there and to take your judgments. And I'm not saying you're not going to make them or have them, but take them and and sideline them, table them, put them over there for a minute, right? You don't need to bring them into your conversation with this person. This person with SLDD, look, they feel bad enough. You don't need to make them feel worse. You don't need to tell them how awful their boss or their partner or their mom or their dad or their kid or their brother or their sister is, right? You don't need to do that. I'm going to tell you from personal experience, and not, not that I have SLDD, but from personal experience with people with SLDD, I'm going to tell you, they feel like shit. They don't feel good. They feel like shit. They don't feel good about themselves. They know something's wrong. Deep down, they know something's wrong. They do. And they don't feel good about themselves. Don't make them feel worse, please. Do me a favor. And if you take nothing away from this episode but just one small thing, please let it be this. Don't make them feel worse. Be there for them. Be consistent. Now, don't break your own boundaries. Don't trample on your own values in order to do so. You can find a compromise. You can find a compromise. Like I said, I've had friends in the past who clearly have SLDD, and I've had to step back from from them at certain points. But I do my best to always let them know that I'm, I'm there for them. And some of them have actually come back to me and, and told me how much that meant to them, that I was there to, without judgment and without pressure. And that I was, I just didn't go away. Uh, in fact, I had a friend, the one that I've talked about before, who I reconnected with recently through my how to um, reconnect with a loved one who won't talk with you anymore program. I reconnected with this person and it was expressed to me that this person genuinely did not know that there were people out there who wouldn't lead them. They didn't know that people, someone out there (laughs) from any background in any regard, friendship, family, love, work, they didn't know that anybody out there in, in any capacity could ever just love them unconditionally. They literally did not know that people who would love them specifically unconditionally existed and that's sad that's horribly sad I can't imagine going through life you know thinking nobody should or would or can love me that that sounds bad just saying it it feels bad to say but this particular person let me know that they appreciated that and you know I, I didn't bend over backwards. I didn't trample on my own boundaries. But when I get the chance with this individual, I try to let them know I care for them. I'm here for them. And if they need anything, if they want to talk, whatever, I'm, I'm here. Any hour of the day or night, you can call me, you can show up on my doorstep, I'm here for you. 
So that's what I want you to take away from this, really, more than anything. Is that you need to be there for this person. And, and you need to, like, not only not only be there, but let them know you're going to be there. Not only let them know that you're going to be there, but actually be there. And do it consistently over a sustained amount of time. Do it consistently. Okay? So let's just really quickly recap on what SLDD is. Just a quick TLDR version uh, like of this of this episode. Basically, people with SLDD or self-love deficit disorder, it's, it's just that. They don't, they don't love themselves. They don't think that they're deserving or worthy of love. They almost have a reversed form of narcissism. They push people away. They don't maintain boundaries. And sadly, many folks with SLDD, you know, they don't appear to be lacking. They're, some of them are very successful and very well thought of and very sought after in, in various areas of their lives. And, you know, some are financially independent. Some aren't, but some are. You're not going to know every person with SLDD like you would a sociopath or a narcissist or a cluster B, right? Or rather, I should say somebody with a cluster B disorder. I don't want to call them a cluster B, but, um, you know, you're not going to be able to pick out an SLDD person out of a crowd without kind of knowing them personally. And I think that it's, uh, just important that we, that we sort of identify this disorder and that we identify that, you know, these are not, again, sociopaths or narcissists or cluster B disordered individuals. These are people who can truly be helped. These are people who are, are very deserving of love, who need, truly need love and need, you know, friendship and need people who care about them. And they need us to tell them, hey, I've got your back. I care about you 100% of the time. So that's, what the, that's who they are. That's what they're about. And basically they subscribe to this like self fulfilling prophecy that they're no good and they're never ever ever going to be any good and they deserve bad bad things from bad bad people so if you know somebody with SLDD or you think you do again be compassionate don't be judgmental I know it's hard but don't even be judgmental about their relationship with a narcissist or sociopath or other disordered individual Just don't be negative with them. Don't be judgmental with them. Again, don't trample over your own boundaries. Maintain your own boundaries. But be there for them. Be unconditional in whatever way you can. Whether that means they can show up at any time and and your house is a safe place for them. Whether that means they can show up, you know, when your husband and kids are awake or when your wife and kids are awake. And, you know, whether it means they can crash on the couch, whether it means that they can just call you any time of day or night, whatever that means, don't just tell them, hey, I love you unconditionally. Be specific. Tell them what that means. You know, just like I've talked about uh, being able to be there for somebody after a, a major loss and how it's important to give a specific, like, offer of help instead of just saying, is there anything I can do to make yourself feel better, even if you genuinely mean it? Instead of just saying, is there anything I can do? Just be specific, right? So same with these folks. Don't just say, hey, I love you. I care for you. I'm always there for you. Whatever you need, say, hey, if you need to talk, I'm a confidential source. You you can say whatever you need. It'll never go anywhere else. I'm a source without judgment. Or just tell them, again, come over anytime. You can sleep on my couch you know, this is a safe place for you, or even just give me a call, or text me anytime you need something. Giving them a specific, a specific outlet, and a specific way to connect with them that shows that you're unconditionally caring, and that you're going to always be there for them, is, is just magical to them. They, and, and maintaining that is, is really important, like we talked about before. 
If you make that offer, you better darn well be able to follow through on it. If you can't, don't make it because you are going to, in fact, make their disorder worse if you can't follow through and you make a promise like that. So it's really important to be able to keep that promise. But show them through your actions and through your dialogue in a sustained way that you're always there for them. Even if they do something really dumb, let them know. While still keeping your boundaries up, you know, for instance, if they were to come over and steal your belongings, you're obviously not going to say, hey, come on back any time. <laughs> but uh, I, I don't suspect that somebody with SLDD would do that, right? But, you know, what I'm saying is if they've, if they've trampled over your boundaries, I enforce them, but still let them know in whatever way you can, you'll always be there for them that you do love them unconditionally. Unconditional love and having bad boundaries are not the same thing. In fact, that's sort of the problem with people who have SLDD. They think unconditional love means constantly proving yourself to somebody else and proving your worthiness to somebody else while simultaneously not thinking that you're actually worthy of their caring or their consideration or their love or their kindness or what have you. It means, to them, it means not having boundaries and just being totally open to this person. You tell them everything. You show them your cell phone at night. You punch that time card. You tell them everything you did during, that, during the day and everyone you talk to. And you lay everything on the line open for their judgment. Well, no. That's not what unconditional really is. Unconditionally loving somebody means respecting yourself, loving yourself, respecting your boundaries, enforcing your boundaries and always being there for other people that you love and care for. And I think sometimes it's good for us to sort of lead by example with folks with SLDD. I really think it's a good idea to show, you know, show them what what boundaries you have with your significant other or with your parent or your kid or sibling or boss or what have you just demonstrate through action what your appropriate boundaries are you know these are things that someone with sldd often didn't learn as a child they didn't learn appropriate boundaries they didn't learn what unconditional love truly means so it's never too late for you to demonstrate time time and again what that means in your life and to be a mirror for them and to show them what they could have if they enforce their own boundaries. So it's good to be an example. It's good to be there for them and to just let them know. And again, let them know all the time. Not necessarily over and over and over every single time you talk, but maybe, you know, if you, let's say you talk every day. Let them know once a week that you're always there for them. Let them know every time they seem upset. You don't want to pry and push and prod, but any anytime they seem upset, anytime they mention that something went wrong with their abuser, let them know over and over again, consistency being key, that you are there for them. Thankfully, this is one of those disorders that can be healed. It can be, you know, changed. And, and of course, the person has to want it. They have to go to therapy, they have to do the shadow work, they have to do the tough, hard, inner work. They have to do the really, really difficult stuff. But over time, it becomes easier. With practice, self-love becomes easier, right? So I have this quote from Buffy the Vampire Slayer that always kind of runs through my mind throughout my workday with my clients. And when I feel it's appropriate to share, I share it with my clients. In fact, I'm going to look it up to make sure that I don't get it wrong right now. So please bear with me. Okay. Okay. Do-do-do. Bear with me. All right. Excuse me for just a moment. So essentially, the, the quote is, 
that if you basically let love run away with you, you're just, you're just its dog and it's your master, right? Right? I'm trying to look for this wonderful quote because I know I'm going to butcher it. I know I'm going to butcher it. But basically, I believe it's in um, the episode in season three of Buffy where Angel comes back and uh, there's this parallel between like abusive relationships and Buffy and Angel's relationship and sort of the inherent animality in all people and the you know ability in healthy people to balance that with sort of a more human more uh, objective side to, to balance that subjectivity with objectivity and the, I believe the quote again it goes something like um, she's talking Buffy's talking to the guidance counselor who's been assigned to her to help her uh, readjust to coming back to school and he says something like if you know basically if you don't have boundaries in your in your life it, with regard to love then you're letting love lead you around by the nose and you're just its dog you're you're letting it lead you around by the nose and that's essentially what the character that represents SLDD in this episode of Buffy the Vampire Slayer does. The character Debbie lets love for her abusive boyfriend uh, lead her around by the nose until it literally destroys her. And, you know, while that's a very literal interpretation of what could happen, right, it's not likely to kill the person, at least not narcissistic abuse or sociopathic emotional abuse while it's not likely to like actually kill the person it could destroy them it could destroy who they are they could they could lose that that thing that makes them who they are that they could lose themselves in the relationship and essentially become love's bitch right so that is sldd for you Go watch that episode of Buffy. Um, I'm going to come back to you later on with a more specific version of that quote. Because, damn it, it is a good quote and I know I butchered it. <laughs> but, uh, essentially, it just it describes self-love deficit disorder perfectly. It encapsulates it beautifully. As beautifully as something like that can be encapsulated, of course. And it's just a really good kind of quote to live by. Um, so I I hope that that gives you some perspective and a little bit of a glimpse into the mind and the life of somebody with SLDD. And I hope that gives you a little bit of a new tool to stick in that tool belt belt that I always reference that you should keep on at all times. And that that will help you to deal with these people and, and to show them that they don't need to live this way. So that's it for now, folks. Thanks for tuning in. And, uh, hey, check if if you are in a situation right now like I was with my uh, loved one that unfortunately did fall into this sort of pit of despair and just could not kind of maintain any friendships, any relationships, any family connections because their abuser was in such control of them. If you if you have a situation like that yourself and you've lost somebody that you love and you're worried you're not going to be able to get them back, buy my book. I, I promise it's not expensive. I'm not it's not like a funneling technique to get you to buy other stuff or come see me, although I'm happy to have you come see me if you'd like to. Um, it's not my goal. I'm just trying to get information out there. Um but buy my book. It's like three ninety nine. I want to say maybe two two ninety nine. But actually, for a limited time, you can still borrow it from the Kindle, Amazon, uh, KDP library for free. So check it out. I'm going to link it below. Uh, it actually is a. It's like a thirty four page little tiny little book slash manual that uh, it, it worked amazingly well for me. I still have the person in, back in my life. 
I still maintain a relationship with them to this day after them not talking to me for years. No matter what I did to try to get a hold of them, they would not talk to me for years. And all because of their abuser, I didn't, we didn't have a falling out. I didn't do anything to hurt them. You know, it, it was simply due to the fact that they were being abused. And they have, this person has SLDD, a severe case of SLDD. A lifelong case of SLDD, I would say. And still, to this day, um, since last year when I first tried this program that I came up with, I have maintained a positive, healthy relationship and open dialogue with this person who has SLDD. And we have made very important strides in working to kind of readjust and, and see what our relationship is going to be from now on. And, you know, just being able to keep in contact with somebody like that for a year or more, oh my God. That is a huge stride, not only in my, you know, my own life, getting somebody back into my life that I care deeply for, but it's a huge stride for this person who, you know, up until that point was not allowed to talk to any friends, loved ones, family, you name it, right? So, you know, if that, if that can work for me, and I did want to try to like test it out on literally the toughest situation possible in my life to see if it worked, if it can work for me and some of my clients and friends who had tough, tough cases to, you know, contend with. And again, people that my friends could not get in touch with, they would not speak to them for years. If it's worked for all of us, there's got to be something about it that works. I don't claim to be some sort of a specific, you know, <clears throat> psychological genius or something, but I do know people and I do know how to phrase things and I do know how to kind of, you know, say things in a way that where people hear it and where people accept it and, and consider my point of view. So I want to share that with you in, in the hopes that I can help you to do the same thing. And what I do in this in this manual, in this book, is to just kind of lay out very specific, personalized messages that you're going to be sending to this person. You're going to need like an email or a text, uh, number to text them on. Again, something their abuser is not going to get a hold of, hopefully. And you're going to want to... Um, very carefully follow this like quick little 34 page manual I lay it out step by step for you I tell you what to do what not to do I give you some good blueprints to work with as far as how to set up your messaging I give you some good uh, pointers and tips on how to really be genuine about it so that it doesn't come off as contrived or you know so that you're not coming from a selfish place and again, it worked for me. It's worked for every single client I have given it to so far. It's worked for every single friend I've given it to so far. So somehow I, I'm on to something here and I want to share it with you. So I'm going to link that somewhere below, either in the description or the chat or something like that. But look for it right here on this podcast episode. Again, I just want to reiterate because I know that there are folks out there really don't have that background in psychology who are peddling these like weird like snake oily you know how to fix your life <laughs> books and programs and the like each thing you click on just funnels you to another website or another episode or another this or another that no not so I'm not trying to make money off of everybody I'm not trying to funnel people I just want you to have the happiness and success that I have found and I hope that I can help you in some small way and that just makes me so excited I love doing this and I love being able to help people bridge gaps and being able to help people understand each other so I could go on about it forever but I won't check it out at the link below and hey you know what remember you're not alone I've got you many 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 
many psychological professionals out there, we've got your back. We, we've got you, okay? Check out YouTube, Google narcissistic abuse. You will find so many, so many amazing therapists, amazing coaches, amazing lifestyle consultants, and you will be all the better for it. So don't ever just take my word or any one person's word on any subject. Go out there. Seek out information. Go out into the world and live in it and soak up every bit of information you can get from every different source you can find. That's what I want you to do. That's your homework, okay? So do that, and if you feel like you can benefit from my book, you can probably still get it for free on the KDP Amazon Kindle lending library online, on your iPhone, your iPad, your computer, your Kindle device, your iPod from 1996, what have you, okay? So I'll let you go do that. Again, you're not alone. Hang in there.